Institute for Advanced Study, I'm really pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. As many of you will be well aware, um, the Institute for Advanced Study for over 20 years has been facilitating and encouraging faculty research and creative activity. One of the primary ways in which we have done this is to have a, a program of visiting fellows. These are individuals who are invited to come to any one of the campuses of Indiana University to spend a period of two or three weeks consulting and collaborating with a, a faculty person. About the only thing that we ask a visiting fellow to do in a public way is to give a presentation so that other members of the university community, the wider public, can be aware of, of their research and their expertise. And it is, of course, that particular program which brings us here this afternoon and that will bring us next Tuesday afternoon, same time but different location, Valentine 109, the lecture um, by our other fellow who is in residence now, John Barrell. I hope you will join us upstairs after this lecture for a reception for both Harriet Guest and John Barrell, and you'll have a chance then to talk with them. I'd like now to pass things on to my colleague Mary Favret, who will introduce this afternoon's speaker. Welcome, and thanks for all coming out. It's a great, great turnout. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Harriet Guest, who's a visiting fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study. She comes to us from York University, where she's a senior lecturer in the English department and co-director of their Center for 18th Century Studies. Her research, as many of us know, has ranged widely throughout the 18th century, from the religious poetry of Christopher Smart, the subject of her first book, to tattooing in the South Pacific, topic for a future book, um, from the politics of the Gothic in the 18th century uh, to the 18th century long poem. Most recently, however, she's turned her attention increasingly to the figure of femininity in the latter half of the century, and has worked to trace that figure through and against discourses of nationalism, commercialism, and education. As a result of the argument and the daunting evidence in her recent book, Small Change, Women, Learning, Patriotism, 1750 to 1810, just out from the University of Chicago Press, I find I have to throw out the familiar maps used for navigating this period. With their facile placement of the public-private divide, their broad, heavily outlined realm of domesticity, all of these coordinates have been changed. Indeed, small change, for all its modest title, transforms the very terrain of gender and culture in the late 18th century. Today's talk, Blue Stocking Feminism, elaborates one portion of the book's argument. Please join me in welcoming Harriet Guest. Pleasure to be here enjoying the facilities of the Institute for Advanced Study and um, the wonderful libraries. Um, as, as Mary said, I want to return to some of the themes of my recent book um, and I hope uh, give them a slightly different um, emphasis. The British Blue Stocking Group has a fairly flexible definition. In its broadest sense, the term refers to 18th century women writers who were socially prominent not because they were aristocratic, and not always because they were wealthy, but because of their learning, because they were women of letters. More narrowly, it can be taken to include most of the well-educated but not aristocratic women linked through correspondence as well as social interaction 
in London, Edinburgh, and perhaps Dublin from around 1750 to the early decades of the 19th century. I've chosen to follow the more focused account of the group given by Sylvia Myers in her invaluable study of the Blue Stocking Circle, which was published in 1990. The women of what Myers calls the first generation of blue stockings, and with whom this paper will primarily be concerned, are Hester Chapone, Elizabeth Carter, Catherine Talbot, and Elizabeth Montague, a group distinguished in their own lifetimes for their successful publications, but now also for the letters they produced and exchanged with each other, and with a wide range of correspondence that included Elizabeth Vasey and Francis Boscawen. This circle of women writers was, on the whole, a conservative group. They were conservative in their political inclinations as well as in their attitudes to class and to sexuality. Like many other women writing in the 18th century before the 1790s, these women did not obviously or vociferously attempt to reform the condition or treatment of women. They spent much of their time socializing with men. The Blue Stocking Circle included men as well as women. It was named, in fact, after the socks that the men wore uh, rather than the women. And mostly men who were also conservative. It is perhaps because of that character, in conjunction with the failure of most of them to show any inclination to write novels, that they did not become prominent as a result of the drive to honor hidden ancestors and meet the pre-feminist family of the past that energized so much feminist inquiry in the 1970s. The nature of feminist interest in women writers of the past has, of course, changed considerably in the last decade or so. Participating as it must in the questions we ask of the present, inquiry into the past has become more tolerant of what had seemed unsatisfactory about these women, more curious about women whose sense of their own relation to the public, social, and political issues of their day seems vague, uncertain, sometimes absent, and who display little confidence or desire that discourses of political or economic theory might articulate a coherent or persuasive account of their circumstances. I'm not, of course, suggesting that there's any simple sense in which we map the present <coughs> onto the past, finding image or likeness of ourselves in 18th century women who did not employ a language of rights and whose sense of themselves as potential agents of cultural or political change was at most oblique. But perhaps we are more prepared now to hear in exchanges between these women ways of thinking about their own lives and social roles that are echoed in later forms of extra-parliamentary political activity. A sense of what constitutes them as a group that may be at least a precondition for the development of feminist political self-awareness. In this paper, I want to explore the extent of this blue-stocking feminism before the fact, and to begin to consider some of the implications of its conservatism. The publications of the blue-stocking women were widely read and celebrated in the second half of the 18th century. Sylvia Myers records that Catherine Talbot's Reflections on the Seven Days of the Week, published after her death in 1770, sold more than 25,000 copies before 1809. Hester Chapone's Letters on the Improvement of the Mind of 1773, addressed to her young niece, became a standard text for issue to young ladies, a handbook on the acquisition of respectable middle-class femininity. These were contributions to genres appropriate to women, essays and manuals of advice that might be thought of as private and feminine versions of the collections of sermons published by clergymen. Chapone's publications did not seriously disrupt her capacity to live in private and impoverished seclusion, though they must have gained her more of the invitations to other people's houses on which her domestic economy depended. She unwisely sold the copyright of the book outright. Elizabeth Carter's translation of the works of Epictetus, in contrast to these more feminine publications, was perceived as a much more direct and dramatic intervention in public life. It involved a degree of classical learning 
to which few women had any access, and it made available texts central to political discourse. As a result, Carter achieved a different kind of fame, a fame that made her, in some sense, public property. Elizabeth Montague's essay on Shakespeare of 1769 was widely praised. She was perceived as a sort of critical defender of faith in the national bard, and therefore in the nation itself, as Horace Walpole acknowledged, however mockingly, in referring to her as Mrs. Montague of Shakespeareshire. <laughs> These women are not as obscure or as isolated as most of the untitled women writers that preceded them. Catherine Talbot, in 1751, lamented the fate of Catherine Trotter Coburn, the poet, playwright, and philosopher active earlier in the century, whose writings had recently been republished in a posthumous collected edition. She wrote, she was a remarkable genius, and yet how obscure her lot in life such straightness of circumstances as perplexes and cramps the mind is surely a grievance. Methinks those who knew such merit did not do their duty in letting it remain so obscure. Talbot feared that Carter might live and die perhaps as obscurely. But Carter's fate was nothing like Coburn's. Carter's remarkable scholarship meant that she was singled out for particular praise as an icon of national progress. And she and her friends, as the exemplary vanguard of women writers of the day, were celebrated as a group by poets, essayists, and reviewers. The cultural significance attributed to the group sets them apart from earlier women writers. But celebrations of them frequently emphasized that their appearance as published authors was licensed by their reputation for conventional feminine skills. By, for example, Montague's fashionable elegance, or Carter's rather more dubious culinary expertise. And these women present themselves as models for acceptable or traditional notions of feminine virtue. The wealthy Montague represents herself as a dispenser of hospitality and philanthropy, while less affluent women, such as Carter and Chapone, defend the privacy of their lives. Carol Pateman recently cautioned against what she calls the narrow view that sees feminist political thought as beginning with Wollstonecraft. But by the 1790s, and within the lifetimes of most of the first generation blue stockings, Catherine McCauley and Mary Wollstonecraft achieved a kind of political articulacy and a degree of public audibility that are central to the emergence of modern feminist politics in Britain. Wendy Gunter Canada points out that the responses of Macaulay and Wollstonecraft to Burke's reflections on the revolution in France were interjections to the historical debate that proved that women could forcefully defend Republican political principles. She argues that Macaulay's observations on the reflections demonstrate that she was no political outsider, while Wollstonecraft's first vindication led directly to the articulation of a theory of the rights of woman. Celebrations of the blue stocking women in newspapers and periodicals and in catalogues of eminent women published before the 1790s link their publications with those of Macaulay. That's the first slide. Macaulay appears as one of their number. She's seated on the right there in Richard Samuel's now famous painting of the Nine Living Muses of Great Britain, which features a number of the women I'm talking about. Wollstonecraft wrote in the second vindication in praise of Chapone's letters. And though she acknowledged that she could not always coincide in opinion with Chapone, she passes easily enough from expressing her respect for this worthy writer to remembering Macaulay as the woman of the greatest abilities, undoubtedly, that this country has ever produced. The relation between blue-stocking women writers and the emergence of a feminist political voice is perhaps too easily dismissed as an odd cont contiguity 
a merely curious historical juxtaposition. A helpful framework for thinking about this relation can perhaps be gleaned from Jürgen Habermas's comments in his Structural <coughs> Transformation of the Public Sphere on the ambivalent relation between what he calls the world of letters, where privatized individuals in their capacity as human beings communicated through critical debate, and secondly, the political realm, where private people in their capacity as owners of commodities communicated through rational critical debate. Habermas explains that the circles of people who made up the two forms of public were not completely congruent. Women and dependents were factually and legally excluded from the public political sphere. But they often took a more active part in the literary public sphere than the owners of private property and family heads themselves. Despite this incongruity, Habermas emphasizes that the fully developed bourgeois public sphere was based on the fictitious identity of the two roles assumed by the privatized individuals who came together to form a public, the role of property owners and the role of human beings, pure and simple. Habermas attributes this fiction of the identity of property owners who have a political voice and human beings who are merely literary subjects to the educated classes who are responsible, he says, for the self-understanding of public opinion. It is these educated classes that <coughs> I'm concerned with, and I want to suggest that the need to recognize and preserve the distinction between the literary and the political publics in conjunction with the fiction that some individuals play the same roles in both are what produced the possibility of blue-stocking feminism with its ambivalently political edge. I want to do this by sketching a rather over-schematized diachronic narrative about the blue-stocking world of letters or blue-stocking sociability. In the 1760s, and early 1770s, blue stocking assemblies were valued because they seemed to exclude the factionalisms of politics. Sir John Macpherson, who was later to become Governor General of India, wrote to Montagu in 1772, remembering visits to her house in 1769 to 70. He commented that George III does not know how much he is indebted to the cheerful and classic assemblies of your Chinese room. He explained that the pleasures of her assemblies gave that sweetness and refinement to the thoughts of our statesmen, statesmen, which could alone counteract the acid and gloom of their dispositions in the period of the Wilkite riots. He thought that Montague's influence had lent debates between leading politicians urbanity and even good humor. And he concluded, we are all indebted to you, and that without your being sensible of it. Montague's role in his account is ambiguously poised between active intervention and the more indirect diffusion of polished manners that is a more traditional feminine skill. And it's a role that to a large extent clearly depends on her enormous wealth. When she moved into her grand London house in Portman Square in 1781, she was able to imagine it as a cross between a public building and a private house. Combining, she wrote, a certain dignity of appearance to the public and elegant accommodations for one's private enjoyment. Montague did not participate actively in politics in the way that some aristocratic, wo aristocratic women did. She didn't canvass in elections, visit military camps, or purchase battleships, as the Duchess of Devonshire and some of her circle did. Montague's assemblies affect political ends because they remove men from their political context and reconfirm their identities as what Habermas calls human beings pure and simple, as private men who participate in the literary public sphere. Montague wrote with admiration in 1772 
of her friend Elizabeth Vesey's talent, uh, talent for bringing together all the heterogeneous natures in the world in the Tuesday assemblies in her blue room, which, she thought, indeed in many respects resembles paradise. For there the lion sits down by the lamb, the tiger dandles the kid, the sly Scotchman and the Ettore di Hibernian, the hero and the macaroni, the vestal and the demi rep the mungo of ministry and the inflexible partisans of incorruptible patriots, beau esprit and fine gentlemen all gather together under the downy wing of the sylph and are soothed into good humor. They refer to Vesey as, as the sylph uh, in, in reference to her uh, rather whimsical personality. Vesey's most famous parties were held in London, but she probably also entertained in Dublin, where she spent much of her time. Her husband represented two Irish constituencies in Parliament and was appointed Accountant General for Ireland. Here she is praised for bringing about an ideal of harmonious national identity, smoothing over political and national differences. Montague writes that were Vesey to withdraw her influence a moment, Discord would reassume her reign, and we should hear the clashing of swords, the angry flirting of fans, and Sir Andrew and Sir Patrick gabbling in dire confusion of the different dialects of the Earth's tongue. Hannah Moore, a decade later, celebrated Vesey's talents as a hostess in her poem, The Bass Bleu, or Conversation, which was written in 1783. But more emphasized in her advertisement to the poem that the blue stocking assemblies or little societies, which she recalls with nostalgic pleasure, had been sometimes misrepresented. She explained that they were composed of persons distinguished in general for their rank, talents, or respectable character, who met frequently at Mrs. Vesey's and at a few other houses for the sole purpose of conversation and were different in no respect from other parties, but that the company did not play at cards. <laughs> Moore goes on, in the advertisement and in the poem, to claim that conversation in these gatherings was in fact different, because it was free of what she calls the censurable errors with which it is too commonly tainted. In a letter of 1781, she praises Vesey for having collected her party from the Baltic to the Po and for encouraging conversation quite in my way. It related chiefly to poetry and criticism. But by 1783, she clearly believed that there had been and was no longer a kind of social world of the educated and polite that was not peculiar to blue stocking gatherings but that perhaps resembled Habermas's notion of the literary public formed by the educated class, a public that could cut across differences of gender and politics. An example of what she means is provided by James Beattie's diary, recording the trip he made to London in 1773 in hopes of garnering praise and preferment as a result of the success of his recently published refutation of David Hume's philosophy. At the beginning of his account, Beattie notes, perhaps rather endearingly, that because he has in the past been traduced by my enemies, he found relief in recollecting the kindness and favorable opinions of my friends. He wants to record all those flattering circumstances in regard to public or private approbation as may hereafter prove a cordial. And he does apparently make a note of almost everyone he meets and everything they say. <laughs> Elizabeth Montague took a strong interest in Beattie's career, and he saw her regularly. She introduced him to much of the diverse range of people that made up London polite society. And perhaps the most striking feature of his lists of dining companions and new acquaintances is the inclusiveness of the metropolitan social world in those years. Beattie hopes to secure a pension from the government, or perhaps the king, and is told that Lord North will be more inclined to look on him favorably because of the lucky circumstance that I am on so good terms with some of the opposition. 
He socializes with Whigs <coughs> and Tories, bishops and dissenters, radicals and conservatives. At Montague's house, he frequently encounters Richard Price, who introduces him to other dissenters. He dines with Catherine Macaulay and spends an evening consuming bread and cheese and porter and singing songs with Alexander Jardine, who Mary Hayes later suggested had discussed the condition of women so ably in his letters from Barbary of 1790 that it seemed unnecessary for her to publish or indeed write her own appeal on behalf of women. Beatty, Price, and Macaulay share, of course, a common <coughs> hostility to Hume's work. But Beatty's diary of 1773 is, I think, typical of journals of this period in suggesting the extent to which the educated form something like a class, a grouping that embraces differences of politics or religious belief. A more famous and striking example of sociability, between men at least, is provided by Boswell's uh, comments on Samuel Johnson's encounter with John Wilkes at a dinner at the house of the dissenting bookseller, Edward Dilley. Boswell thought the encounter had the agreeable and benignant effect of reconciling any animosity and sweetening any acidity which, in the various bustle of political contest, had been produced in the minds of the two men who, though widely different, had so many things in common, classical learning, modern literature, wit, humor, and ready repartee. His comments emphasize that the pleasure Wilkes and Johnson apparently take in each other's company in 1776 is remarkable. Not least, of course, because Boswell is so pleased with himself, with his own success in setting the occasion up. And by the mid-1770s, when Dilly's dinner party takes place, it had become unusual for political differences between men to be set aside for the sociable <coughs> pleasures of a shared taste in classical learning and modern literature. By the mid-1770s, as Kathleen Wilson has argued, the complexities and sheer novelties of waging a war against the colonies and the fractious and contradictory demands it placed upon the claims of patriotism and citizenship polarized the nation and divided opinions in ways that did not necessarily follow party lines, but which increased what Wilson identifies as the radical potential of opposition to the war and to the ministry. Historians differ in their characterizations of the fault lines that opened up in British society during the early years of the American conflict, but they agree that the rifts were dramatic and deep. The women of the blue stocking circle were, I suggest, not so rapidly or divisively polarized as were educated men in their attitudes to the major issues of the mid-70s, the conduct of the ministry, the increasing power of the monarch and the developing crisis in the American colonies. Partly because most of them do not seem to have wanted to imagine themselves as having a role to play in a political world as opposed to the world of letters. Before the 1770s, many of the women of the blue stocking group seem to have seen little or no overlap between their own lives and the political events of the time. They exchange news about court and parliamentary politics, but they most usually handle it as a spectator sport, as something in which they do not participate and which they view with some detachment. Elizabeth Carter commented in 1767 on a possible change in the administration that, indeed, it seems of no great consequence what particular person goes out or comes in as there seems to be nothing in the general system of politics likely to produce any great good. Of that only true policy, the aim of which is to make a nation virtuous and happy, there does not appear to be any idea existing <coughs> through all the various changes of men and of measures that have happened among us. All the rest is mere party and faction and the opposition of jarring interests among individuals. Carter clearly welcomes news about political events in London, 
that Montague's letters bring her and which she discusses energetically. Her comments do not indicate a disaffection that extends into lack of interest or opinion. And the disillusion with parliamentary politics that she voices from early in the 1760s echoes and endorses views that were widespread and that quickened extra-parliamentary political activity. But in her letters, dismay at the state of party politics and public affairs confirms and strengthens her belief in the values and virtues of private life. So, for example, she writes on this familiar refrain in 1763, how thankful ought they to be whom the obscurity of private life shelters from the turbulence of ambition and preserves from the temptations of power. Repeatedly, throughout the six decades between 1741 and 1800, covered by her published correspondence, discussions of political affairs lead Carter to meditate on the joys of the private life to which she sees herself as confined. Hester Chapone, who corresponded with Carter over 50 years or so, agreed with her friend in a letter of 1751 that there is very little virtue and a great deal of iniquity and corruption to be found among those who are engaged in public life, adding that those are not the people in whom we ought to look for virtue. Human nature is not to be judged of by the most corrupted part of it. Like Carter, she emphasized the positive benefits enjoyed by women as a result of their exclusion from public life, writing that private life is without doubt the most innocent and I will never seek friendships out of it. Therefore, I hope I shall not be a great sufferer from the corruptions of the grand monde, nor lose my benevolence in the resentment of injuries. This commitment to a life excluded from politics may reinforce the sense in which this group of educated women define themselves increasingly as a distinctively gendered collective, and not only as members of the educated class. With increasing frequency and explicitness, I think, they value the work of other women, because it is produced by women, and in terms of notions of literary value, rather than political opinion. For the blue stocking women themselves took a keen interest in the productions of other women, and women readers seem to have taken a strong interest in promoting and patronizing their work. Talbot liked to joke to Carter about the interest that fine ladies would take in her translation of Epictetus, published in 1758. But more than a quarter of the subscribers to the first edition were women, a figure that may be most significant as an indication of the willingness <coughs> of women readers to be seen to be patronizing women writers. Many of the women subscribers are listed alongside their husbands, so their names are presumably not just there because they were anxious to get hold of a copy. They wanted their names to be in the book. Talbot urged Carter, with more seriousness, to take pride in the notion that her Epictetus would do honor to Epictetus, yourself, your country, and womankind. In their correspondence, all of the women eagerly read and discuss publications by women. Carter felt a triumph in the success of new women writers, such as the playwright Joanna Bailey. She commented positively on Macaulay's History of England, and in the 1790s praised Helen Maria Williams' Letters from France and Charlotte Smith's poetry, despite her disagreement with democratic <coughs> politics. As her nephew explained, she had the decided bias in favor of female writers and always read their works with a mind prepared to be pleased. She believed that women had not their proper station in society and that their mental powers were not rated sufficiently high. And she and Chapone corresponded about their disapproval for what they saw as the contemptuous manner in which Samuel Johnson generally speaks of women in The Rambler. Chapone noted, in the context of this discussion, that you carry your partiality to your own sex further than I do, 
Indeed, you have the strongest reason to think highly of it and have the best right of any woman in the world to expect others to do so too. What's interesting about this, I think, is the clear indication that these women think of their gender in terms of collective identities and are strongly aware of the representative status that they and other women writers have in relation to that collectivity. It seems to be this consciousness of a gendered group identity and of their capacity to represent its interests that informs the powerful sense of their duty or obligation to be socially and publicly useful. Have the next slide, please. The group identity of learned women is, of course, inflected and to some extent diversified by differences of wealth and social rank. In the mid-1760s, the fashionable women's portrait painter, Catherine Reed, painted both Carter and Macaulay. This is Carter. It's not a very good slide, I'm afraid. Um, but you get the sense of it. Carter and Macaulay, in her portraits, were dressed alike in silky and vaguely classical drapery and equipped with the tools of their expertise. Mm. Carter with her quill and a copy of her Epictetus, which is under her hand there. Macaulay with a historical scroll. Have the next one. <coughs> and volumes of her history. You can see the, their clothes are almost identical. Perhaps Catherine Reed kept them in her studio and just pulled <laughs> them off. <laughs> the similarity between the two images suggests the way catalogues of learned or eminent women, several of which were published in the second half of the 18th century, grouped their subjects together allowing their exceptional learning and gender to obscure differences between them. In this case, perhaps, not so much explicit political differences, for, as I've mentioned, Carter approved the spirit of Macaulay's history, but differences of social station. Carter was the relatively impecunious daughter of a provincial pe perpetual curate. To her, Catherine Sawbridge Macaulay, as the daughter of a wealthy city family, was a fine, fashionable, well-dressed lady whose train was longer than anybody's train. Reed seems to have approached Montague with the intention of producing a companion portrait of her. But Montague wrote that, I cannot see what can give me admission to the set of distinguished ladies. She claimed that she could not appear as one of the select and sacred number nine, as, they, as there were in this land 9,000 such sort of good women as I. Certainly weren't 9,000 as rich as her. <laughs> it's interesting that Montague should refer to the portraits as the beginnings of a set of what seemed to be national muses. She took strong exception to Macaulay's work and politics and seems to have been surprised by Carter's tolerance. But she's reported to have commissioned Reed's portrait of Carter presumably in the knowledge that it would appear to be one of a set that included Macaulay. Her reasons for not wanting to be portrayed in that set herself are also interesting. She wrote to Carter that, I know even your partiality never could distinguish me for anything but making good marmalade, <laughs> and claimed that she could only be drawn with a pot of orange sweetmeat honorably labeled in ye style of receipts, orange marmalade the best way. <laughs> she adds, perhaps more revealingly, that I believe all the men on the other side of Temple Bar, and some on ours, will worship the marmalade muse, and you, Sappho, will be neglected. <laughs> perhaps she suggests that men, and particularly city merchants on the other side of Temple Bar, are most interested in their stomachs. But she also implies that the glamour of her wealth from her husband's lands and collieries may outshine in their unphilosophical eyes the luster of her friend's learning and poetic skill. The next slide, please. The classical style of dress worn by Carter and Macaulay in Reed's portraits became a character characteristic feature, almost a trademark, of representations of Macaulay throughout the 1770s. 
in the portraits engraved as frontispieces <coughs> to the volumes of her history, and in the infamous statue of the historian commissioned by her friend Thomas Wilson in 1778, in the ceramic figurine of her, and in the two oil portraits painted by Robert H. Pine in the mid-1770s. This is one of them, and the next slide is another. In these portraits, her dress and hairstyle cast her as a Roman matron, a figure reminiscent of the severe ideals of the early Roman Republic. Later images of Carter, however, present a more softened and private image. Next one. Can you focus it a bit more? <coughs> In Lawrence's pastel portrait of 1790, this is it, for example, her modesty and retirement are indicated by her downward gaze and mob cap, though her scholarship is hinted at in her high brow and in the suggestion of an academic gown in the black material around her shoulders. In the mid-70s, after the publication of her essay on Shakespeare, Montague's portrait was painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds. There's no reference in this image to the success of Montague's essay on Shakespeare. Instead, she's shown sitting with her hands folded in her lap, apparently listening and attending to some unseen figure, with an expression which I imagine is meant to suggest patience and benevolence. In this print of the image, the splendor of her clothes is pronounced. There's no sign of the ascetic simplicity associated with the Roman Republic here. And if there is self-denial, it is in the forbearance indicated by her expression. She looks to me as though she's being annoyed by a, an animal or a child or something. <laughs> Not in plainness of material adornment. Sat alongside Reed's portraits of Carter. Reynolds's image suggests Montague's wealth and power, powers of patronage rather than her personal productivity or literary fame. Montague occasionally, at least, endorsed this image of herself as a patron rather than an author. When she cultivated an acquaintance with Anna Aiken, later Barbold, in 1774, she introduced herself with the explanation that, you must not expect to find in me the talents which adorn the friends around me. I shall not think myself disgraced in your opinion if you find something in me to love, though nothing to admire. The genuine effect of polite letters is to inspire candor, a social spirit, and gentle manners, to teach a disdain of frivolous amusements, injurious censoriousness, and foolish animosities. To partake of these advantages and to live under the benign empire of the muses on the conditions of a naturalized subject who, not having any right to a share of office, credit, or authority, seeks nothing but the protection of a society is all I aim at. Montague's comments here echo her response to Catherine Reed nearly a decade earlier. In both, she denies that she has any direct claim to identification with the muses. In this letter, she may be being deliberately disingenuous about her reputation. But nevertheless, the letter does confirm that she prided herself on her powers of social organization and patron patronage. For the emphasis here is on the consumption of polite letters and the distinctive forms of sociability enjoyed by the well-educated, in that they do instill notions of polite, enlightened behavior as opposed to aristocratic decorum through their sociability, through the conversational practices, the importance of which they so frequently emphasize. It is perhaps enlightenment theories of a civilized polish diffused by the sociability of women that inform representations of Elizabeth Montague, which emphasize her importance, not so much as the author of the essay on Shakespeare, defending him from what were perceived as the anglophobe strictures of Voltaire, but as a philanthropist and patron. In, for example, the central position James Barry gave her in his huge image, this is just a detail from it, of the distribution of the premiums in the Society of Arts. <coughs> 
This painting is one of, one of a series of six murals on the progress of human culture, which Barry painted for the Society of Arts between 1777 and 1784. Uh, slightly to the left here, Elizabeth Montague presents a protege. Um, the Society of Arts regularly gave prizes for um, uh, women who produ who'd, who'd produced prodigious amounts of spinning, that sort of thing, um, which I think is probably the sort of thing that she's holding this, this, this woman for, ho forward for. Um, while on the right, Samuel Johnson, you can just see between the, the heads of the two women now, urges her example on the duchesses of Rutland and Devonshire. <laughs> 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 Barry's mural points up the uneasy relation between Montague as the exemplary patron of what appears to be a poor but deserving girl and the duchesses, both of whom were of course actively and even scandalously involved in national politics in these years. Montague, like the duchesses, is exceptional because of her wealth. But Montague's philanthropic interests are not represented as setting her apart from other women as did the rank and public prominence of the duchesses. Montague here is the patron and sponsor of women rather than of politicians. I do not, of course, want to suggest that the interests of the blue stocking women were exclusively absorbed in or centered on their gendered identities, though femininity becomes a more prominent and to some extent defining characteristic of their group as part of the process of historical change that produces polarized divisions in polite and educated British society in the mid-1770s. Carter wrote to Montague in 1778 when the fame of her classical scholarship was well established, commenting that she had received much more literary information among politicians than I did from a company of scholars and authors as if the two sexes had been engaged in a state of war, the gentlemen raged, ranged themselves on one side of the room where they talked their own talk and left us poor ladies to twirl our shuttles and amuse each other by conversing as we could. By what little I could overhear, our opposites were discoursing on the old English poets and this subject did not seem so much beyond a female capacity but that we might have been indulged with a share in it. Carter seems surprised and disappointed by the gendered division she encounters. Her remarks suggest that at dinner with male politicians, literary information had provided common ground, had been available as a conversational space in which gendered identities could be set aside in favor of something like Habermas's pure humanity. But in the company of scholars and authors, she implies that women have been excluded from a literary discussion that is properly their conversational resource and consigned to the world of things rather than ideas left to twiddle their shuttles. The feminine right to Habermas's public world of letters seems to be confirmed by its juxtaposition with the political realm where masculine owners of commodities communicated through rational critical debate, as Habermas says. Carter's comments seem both to confirm and deny what Habermas describes as the fictitious identity of the two roles assumed by the privatized individuals who came together to form a public, the role of property owners and the role of human beings, pure and simple. For here, in the party she describes, politicians seem able to discuss literature with women because of the sense in which the world of literature is private and intimate, is purely human. That sense of it is thrown into relief by its juxtaposition with the possibility of political discussion, the possibility of the conversation the politicians would have if they were not relaxing in the company of women. Whereas the men of literature in the company of women may need to preserve more firmly the fiction that their role in the intimate but public world of letters is identical with their more explicitly manly <coughs> role as property owners in the public world of political debate. They need to insist on their gender 
perhaps because it is not confirmed by active engagement in the political arena. Carter's dismay at her exclusion from literary discussion indicates the strength of her sense of her right to take part. And in Habermas's terms, that might imply a right to at least a fiction of participation in political discussion. When Catherine Macaulay and Mary Wollstonecraft intervene in the debate over the politics of the French Revolution in the 1790s, their intervention is perceived to be unsexing. Wollstonecraft writes about Macaulay that she was an example of intellectual uh, acquirements supposed to be incompatible with the weakness of her sex. In her style of writing, no sex appears, for it is like the sense it conveys, strong and clear. I will not call hers a masculine understanding, because I admit not of such an arrogant assumption of reason, but I contend that it was a sound one. Both Macaulay and Wollstonecraft seem at least occasionally to find it necessary or convenient to set gendered identity to one side in order to engage in political argument. But the character in which the first generation of blue stockings gain access to the public world of letters is unambiguously feminine, its gendered character reinforced by their support for the work of women and their distance from political involvement. I suggested that blue stocking forms of sociability in the 1760s and early 1770s could be understood as having an ambivalently political character precisely because of the ways in which their assemblies turned away from or smoothed over political differences. After the mid-70s, that ambivalently political character becomes perhaps more distinctly, distinctively associated with their gender rather than with their status as members of the educated classes, while male members become, because of that definition, more clearly distinct from the unambiguously masculine world of political participation. Blue stocking sociability may thus have made available the fiction or fantasy of a feminine political voice, or at least it may have made it possible for more explicitly political writers, such as Macaulay, Wollstonecraft, and later Hayes, to think about gender as a collective identity in ways that were more directly and explicitly political. <laughs> 